class is now in session. I am Professor Hockey, and today we're discussing game 39 of the regular season between the San Jose Sharks and the Pittsburgh Penguins, in which the Sharks have lost 2-1 to one in overtime. The second straight loss here for the San Jose Sharks, and yet the second straight loss in which the Sharks likely deserved a much better outcome. At the very least, they do manage to get a single point here tonight compared to the previous loss against the Rangers in which they got shut out. However, the Sharks absolutely would have loved to get the two points, and you definitely can say that they deserved it as well as the Sharks, by all accounts, were the at the very least slightly better team here tonight and probably leaning more to a good bit better than the Pittsburgh Penguins looked here and yet even with the massive lopsided shots the Sharks would actually be unable to close out this game and they'd even lose their first overtime game of the season now with their slightly less than pristine overtime record of 6 and 1. And this was a game that is kind of a bit less excusable than the previous one. Against the Rangers, the Sharks got shut out. But that was by Igor Shesterkin, who has been one of, if not the best goaltender in the NHL thus far this season. Here tonight, it was not the usual, you know, uh, Tristan Jari, who has been pretty solid for the Pittsburgh Penguins, or even Casey DeSmith. No, no, it was in fact backup, backup goaltender Louis Domingue in between the pipes. Career borderline NHL back up goaltender in uh, over these past few years he's probably not even a top 50 goaltender in the NHL he doesn't even sniff Igor Shesterkin who's right near the top and so having the only being able to actually score a single goal against him is a bit more embarrassing than the previous night against the Rangers especially since the Sharks had over 40 shots here tonight and the one goal that they did score was one of those sure goals that I alluded to in my previous review again uh, for the Rangers game Balsers receives a very nice pass from Eric Carlson and has a very, very easy tap in in that situation. But otherwise, the Sharks, once again, just not doing enough when it comes to the offensive side of things to really get some grade A opportunities. There were chances here. There were two on ones. But a lot of the time, they were very one and done. Not a lot of sticks on the ice. Not a lot of plays getting to the rebounds and anything like that. And so Domingue, He didn't necessarily have that difficult of a night. He played very well. The Sharks made him look very well, or very good. But he also wasn't anything miraculous here. The Sharks just making it a bit too easy on him. But the general good news is that the Sharks played well. This first period started off, and the Sharks were clearly emphasizing coming into this game to have a better start than they did in the previous one against the Penguins. Not as though that Bob Booner doesn't always emphasize having a good start, but you know that there was a little bit of extra in that message, considering the last time the Sharks played the Penguins, they fell behind 4-0 within the first few minutes of the first. And the Sharks played very well to start this game. They were the team getting the majority of the chances, and eventually a few minutes in, it would be Rudolph Spalsers putting the Sharks up 1-0. However, a few minutes later, Chris Letang would make a nice play for himself. He gets around Mario Ferraro. He freezes Aiden Hill, scores, and ties the game at 1, and that would be the only scoring for the rest of the game. The first period would finish off with the Sharks still looking very solid, but not able to get another one onto Domingue. Not the end of the world at the end of 20 minutes. And in the second period, the Sharks were still the better team firing many shots onto Domingue, but still not being able to beat him a second time. And so it's 1-1 after 40. And in the third period, this is where the Penguins did make a bit of a comeback for themselves. Definitely looked a lot more competitive, especially during the last few minutes. The Sharks seemed to be much more holding on to just the single point, while the Penguins really wanted to get the two and leave the Sharks with none. Fortunately, I guess you can say, since the Sharks ended up losing, fortunately for the Sharks, they managed to hold off the Penguins' late period assault. Salt, get this one into overtime where the Sharks, interestingly enough, they decide to go with a Noah Gregor, Logan Couture, and Eric Carlson trio. Usually in the past few overtimes, the Sharks have gone with Meyer Hurdle with Eric Carlson. I don't know the reasoning why they didn't just start with that hurdle. In fact, did not get an overtime shift here tonight, mostly because there were only a couple of shifts in this overtime before the game was ended by Jake Gensel, but still it's kind of strange that Hurdle isn't given the opportunity considering he has multiple overtime goals so far this season, but they go with Couture and Gregor, they get a chance on net I guess, easy save for Domingue faceoff comes, it ends up being a Couture Meyer duo with Brent Burns at the back Puck goes the other way, Burns gets skated around by Sidney Crosby usual Sidney Crosby he goes to Jake Gensel, Timo Meyer unable to tie up his stick, and it's the tap in for Jake Gensel on the back door. 
Penguins win it 2-1. Moving on to the players to talk about on the first line. Balser's desk managed to get the goal here, which was nice to see him contribute. Not as though that he was the big part of this particular play. It was very handedly in the sort of... Uh, a lot of credit that does have to go to Eric Carlson for essentially spoon feeding this goal to Rudolf Spalsers, but still nice to see him finally get his third goal of the season. He had been injured for a very long period of time, I think at least a month, if I'm not mistaken, and he'd been thrust into this role on the first line that had previously been rolling prior to the Barabanov COVID protocol issue, and so he had some big shoes to fill, and he hasn't been doing a fantastic job, but at the very least, he hasn't looked like a complete fish out of water in this situation either. When it comes to both Meyer and Hurdle, they got some good chances. Meyer, in particular, I thought was continuing to be his usual for the San Jose Sharks. He even got an assist on the Balser's goal, the secondary assist there. And definitely set himself up for a few chances, but not, like I mentioned earlier, not a lot of really great sort of uh, fantastic golden opportunities or anything like that. There were some good shots and some of them were from decently in close, but nothing insanely dangerous, I would say. Still a very good performance from this top line, but not amazing like we had seen during that Sharks three-game winning streak. When it comes to the second line of Couture, Dahlin, and Gregor, these players certainly got some chances for themselves. In particular, Gregor probably had three or four pretty great chances throughout this game and as it is the usual for Noah Gregor he was unable to bury on any of them luckily for himself he does at least have a goal in this season thus far because with the way that this has been going for Noah Gregor thus far this season or at least recently pretty recently at the very least uh, it doesn't seem as though he's going to be getting another goal at any time soon. It kind of reminds me earlier on in this season when it was Nick Benino who went, what was it, the first 20 or so games of the season without actually being able to score a goal. Noah Gregor seems to be in that very similar rut. I guess you could say the good news is that maybe if one goal does go in for Gregor, the dam could break, but... I, I don't know. We'll see how long he manages to maintain a spot in the top six. Once Barabanov does return from the COVID protocol with Rudolf Balser still uh, healthy, I suspect that Gregor could be the man pushed out of the top six. It's possible Balser ends up being that guy, but it wouldn't surprise me if Gregor does. So he really needs to make more uses of the opportunity he currently has because it might not last for much longer. When it comes to the third line of Nieto, Benino, and Cogliano, they got a bit pushed in here tonight. There were a couple of decent moments of speed from a player like Matt Nieto, but nothing insane in terms of actual opportunities. So this third line, not too, too great. And when it comes to the fourth line, the only player who has been even remotely noticeable and this is maybe just because I've been keeping a specific eye on him would be Adam Raska if you told me Weatherby I mean this is something I've said about Weatherby at least a dozen times thus far this season if you told me Weatherby wasn't playing in this game I'd probably believe you he did essentially nothing here I think the only time I even noticed Weatherby is when he got in the way of Ryan Merkley trying to bring the puck into the offensive zone and the Sharks lost control of it because of that that's really his biggest contribution to the game though I wouldn't say he was a negative force for the Sharks either when it comes to VL also not super noticeable besides his usual VL antics Raska I thought had a couple of decent plays but like I said this is probably just me keeping a specific eye on him and not because he actually stood out in such a mega positive light or anything like that once again the fourth line for the San Jose Sharks not doing really anything offensively but at the very least isn't a liability on to the defensive side of things, Ferraro and Burns. Honestly, ever since the return from COVID protocol for Mario Ferraro, I haven't necessarily been as blown away by him as I maybe was a bit earlier on this season. Not as though that he was fantastic earlier on, but he certainly seemed to be giving it his all. And I'm not going to say that he hasn't been giving it his all as of late, but he just hasn't really had that that extra bit of oomph I don't know if maybe the co he actually had COVID and it actually took like a, a bit out of him or anything like that but it feels as though there's just a slight issue with Mario Ferraro's game that I can't really put my finger on it but hopefully he can come back a bit from that when it comes to his defensive partner Brent Burns Burns had an okay game not doing a ton offensively but he had relatively solid defensive numbers I would say and so certainly not too too bad on the second pairing the obvious standout once again for what seems like the millionth straight game at this point almost is eric carlson 
the or especially earlier on in this game in the first period it felt as though that the hurdle meyer balsers trio as long as well with eric carlson were just completely skating circles around the pittsburgh penguins like they had done in the previous game against the rangers like they had done in the previous game against the flyers like they had done you get the idea basically eric carlson has just been really really good as of late it's good to see him try and stay healthy at this point he's been staying healthy for most of this season though he has missed a couple of games he seems to be really in his element at this point and while I won't say he's worth the $11.5 million that he, the Sharks are currently paying him, he is in one of his best forms as a San Jose Shark thus far since he was picked up at the uh, in the 2019 or 2018 offseason, and that is certainly nice to see. On the third pairing, once again, going to just briefly mention Ryan Merkley, who I would say had a pretty solid game here once again tonight. Defensively seemed to be having some solid positioning at the very least, or at least decently solid positioning. Has been complemented well by the presence of Mark Edward Vlasic, who surprisingly hasn't been too completely awful over these past few games. Nice to see that at the very least. If there is one thing, it's the same criticism that I gave him in the previous game, when they were against the Rangers. Merkley, he does need to be slightly quicker when it comes to making some of these plays. It's nice that he's trying to carry the puck a lot. He is a, supposed to be a puck moving defenseman. That is uh, sort of his description of his style of play, but he needs to actually get that puck moving a bit more from himself to a different player and dish it out because at times he's just been holding it a bit too long and he got punished for that a couple of times here tonight. And finally, we move on to the goaltender Aiden Hill, who I don't think necessarily had that bad of a night didn't really have much of a chance on the on the uh, Gensel goal did obviously kind of get a bit embarrassed on the Chris Letang goal by a very nice move by Letang he bites on the fake shot and then Letang ends up just putting it in on the backhand but it's hard to necessarily blame him for the breakaway goal yes you could make the argument like I did with uh uh, with Aiden Hill in the previous game against the Rangers uh, against Shesterkin where he did lose the goalie goaltender duel here tonight and that is technically true but like it was in the previous game against the Rangers I wouldn't necessarily put either of these two games completely on the shoulders of Aiden on the shoulders of Aiden Hill because once again for the fifth straight game now the Sharks have only given up two goals on a mandanet at the very least. But that will do it for this review. The Sharks will be back in action on Monday where they will take on the Los Angeles Kings. The first time the Sharks will be playing the Los Angeles Kings thus far this season, if I'm not mistaken at the very least. Kings have actually been rather solid thus far this year. They are actually in a playoff spot at this point. They seem to be making a run. They've got former uh, Sharks head coach Todd McClellan behind the bench and we'll see if the Sharks can get an advantage over the Kings because last season at the very least the Sharks seemed to have the Kings number class dismissed.